Did you look at the renin angiotensin aldosterone video? Yes. Did you? That's good. Cardiogenic shock? Did you look at cardiogenic shock? Yeah. Did you look at the intra aortic balloon pump? No. No. Me, what? no. I don't know what that means. See, he'd be throwing stuff out there and he'd be like, what do you, I did not see a video named. So, did you look <laughs> at the <laughs> clinical <laughs> manifestations <laughs> of uh, cardiogenic shock? That was talked about in the video. And then I think there was treatments of cardiogenic shock, wasn't oh, there? Oh, that was the last six minutes of the video. I didn't quite get to them yet. Oh, well, intra-aortic balloon pumps in there, sister. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really, you know, uh, encourage me to make more videos. Oh, my kid. I said, you get a girl pregnant, I'm a, I will kill you. And that was my her. sex she talk. Pregnant, I will kill you. First, I'm going to have my grandbaby. Then I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, right. I ain't kicking you out, but... You're thinking about buying it? Yeah. How much is it? 35000 Who's selling it? Uh, somebody in the <laughs> <Right. laughs> It's got a uh, 5.0 V8 Cobra engine in it. Oh, for 35000 It's an 89. But it looks in just sweet shape. It really does. Yeah.
Hey, I learned how to say uh, emergency room in Spanish. But I forgot. <laughs> it's uh, something inferme. How do you say it? You know how to say it? One time when I lived in Chicago, and the, my back door to my apartment, I lived on the third floor, I was busted in, right? And that person knew I wasn't coming back because I had like a cake, like a little stand of CDs. And this guy didn't take all; he went through and picked out the ones he wanted. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then just to show that he knew I wasn't coming back, he dropped a big deuce in the toilet and left it there. That's just sad. <laughs> People are, you know, I don't know. Who knows? Well, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, I put up that video from last class, yeah? The, the audio was pretty good, huh? huh? Yeah. I was really impressed with that. Okay. So what do you want to talk about? I'm going to leave it up to you. Okay, don't pop it. Don't pop it. The best protection you have against infection is intact skin. Write that down. Okay. Uh, we're going to finish up congestive heart failure, yes? Okay. So I'm going to be, uh, um, what? All right. I went over the medications used to treat congestive heart failure, right? I went over the medications that would reduce preload, the diuretics, yes? Um, the drugs that reduce afterload, typically calcium channel blockers are avoided because you don't want a, the heart that's not contracting very well to contract less, say yes, and that you use digitalis, right, digoxin. And I explained to you that um, how you, um, you, you have to digitalize somebody. I explained that to you, right? 
and then the maintenance therapy, and that the toxic dose of digitalis and the therapeutic dose is very close. That's why it has to be monitored frequently. And some of the side, uh, side effects of digitalis are um, uh, arrhythmias, of course, like uh, bradycardias, because it slows the conduction of the heart. You got me? And um, nausea and vomiting. And then the classic one is like a yellow-green halo to your vision. You got me? So if somebody's trying to paint yellows and greens in your Sistine Chapel, check a ditch level. And why is it important to have a potassium level before you give digitalis? Because if the potassium's too high, well, that Jackson won't work. Like, That's so right. Slowly, you have too much. That's right. So the potassium level has to be normal. And listen up, because I explained this, that digoxin competes for the potassium binding sites on the sodium potassium pump. So if the potassium is high, the potassium will win, so that will reduce the effectiveness of digitalis. Or if it's too low, it will increase its effectiveness, can lead to toxicity. That's why you need a ditch level, say, yeah. OK. All right. So make sure, now watch. And you, you have the questions I gave you, right? Now, I'm not going to give you a question like, um, one of the things that can happen in CHF is that they'll be short of breath. Do you follow that? I'm going to, I want you to understand the pathophysiology and I'm going to give you pointed questions to make sure that you understand the pathophysiology. Say, yeah. Okay. All right, where am I? Oh, wait. I already gave you extra credit for this, right? Oh, is it for the next test? Yeah, okay. Yeah, because it was after you, we had the other test. Yeah. You talked about the research thing. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, you did good. All right. Watch. Anybody work on a, like a cardiac floor at all? Anybody? Well, everyone just here, pull the seat around. <laughs> Why is that doing that? Any, anybody? What do you, where do you work? You work in the emergency room? No. Oh, have you ever heard of a blood test called a BNP? Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to explain it better though, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I'm going to explain how that works. Okay. Who, who, yeah? Come on. Having a bed. We should have drinks in here. Yes. Don't you think so? I don't, I who would tell? See, there's somebody who would tell. You know who would tell? Anna. Why? I just looked at her, right? We were talking about drinking, and then she's looking down. She's already typing up a little message <laughs> a reminder how come this ain't working I saw it there for a minute I get in trouble. Okay. Watch. Have you ever overstretched your ventricle? Yes. No. You have? When? No. <laughs> you may have stretched it, but have you ever overstretched it? No. no. Who overstretches their ventricle? People with CHF, because we're talking about CHF, that was a really good guess. Who's following this? Now watch. 
when the ventricle gets overstretched, there are specialized cells, I want this, there are specialized cells inside the ventricular wall yep. that release a hormone called BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. It's called brain natriuretic peptide because it was first isolated in sheep's brains by Mr. Natriuretic. I think Nancy has kind of a weird sense of humor because like, that's just not funny. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that don't help. Okay, now watch, watch. The only time the brain natriuretic peptide is released is when the ventricles are overstretched. Who gets overstretched ventricles? People with CHF. So one of the blood tests that they use to routinely monitor how well a patient with CHF is doing is doing what's called a BNP. Now let me give you an example. Now, you're going to get this, right? Remember that the left side of the heart receives its blood from what vessels? The pulmonary veins, right? And then the pulmonary veins start getting smaller and smaller until they terminate where? What's the smallest? Yeah, yeah, you couldn't go wrong, right? So you have an alveoli, and how thick are alveoli? That's right, and how thick are capillaries? So watch, as the blood begins to back up into the pulmonary capillaries due to that left ventricle failing, yes? then capillary fluid pressure starts increasing and it starts forcing fluid, <coughs> water, into the alveoli. Say yes. And you will hear that in the lungs as this like little rice crispy sound. You will hear like crackling. You've, you've heard the term, right? That is fluid in the alveoli. Now watch. Which is easier for oxygen diffuse, to diffuse through air or to diffuse through water? Air, right? Did you get us anything? Yes. What did you get us? Nothing. That's something. So as the fluid builds up, oxygen delivery is going to be impaired. You're not going to be able to oxygenate the blood. And will you be able to get rid of carbon dioxide? No. So these people will develop a respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Say yes. yes. So the BNP, the higher the BNP, the worse their congestive heart failure is. And okay, I'll give you a, I'm telling you a question. I'm telling you a question. You ready? You need to know the normal lab value for BNP. I think it's less than 300. I don't know. I haven't done my BNP in a while. I do that every third Thursday of the month. I think it's, no, it's the first Thursday of the month. I don't do it then. Two more Thursdays, then I'm going to do it. Might not have class next Thursday. Two Thursdays from now. <laughs> I, I know. Tell me you got that, guys. Okay, so what would be some of the signs and symptoms of a person who has an exacerbation of their CHF? Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Come on. Nice. They will be SOB, short of breath. Yep. What else? Right. They will be uh, a weak. Right. They will have 
peripheral edema. Right? What else? They'll have weight gain. Who said that? Good. That's why these people's weight have to be monitored. What are you going to hear in their lungs? You're going to hear those crackles in the bases and then watch, watch. These are your lungs. As the fluid starts building up, as the CHF starts getting worse, the fluid will get higher and higher into the lungs. Tell me you got that. Now, what's going to happen to their heart rate? Their heart rate's going to go up, right? Because lack of oxygen stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. So they're going to have an increased heart rate. They're going to be tachycardic. Got to start using these words. Tachycardic. Yeah, that's a good one. You got me? And their blood pressure may drop because the left ventricle is getting overstretched. Say yes. Now, this is really important, and this is no joke. People with congestive heart failure, if they come in with an exacerbation and their medications are being changed, they have to be monitored frequently. Because when this situation goes downhill, it goes downhill very, very fast. And I'm going to explain to you why it goes downhill very, very fast. Say yes. Now, what's the little thingy they put on your finger? Pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. And what does that measure? SPO2. Right? What, what's SPO2? Zero. What part of the blood? Yeah, that's good. Are you drinking AMP juice over there? That's Fiji juice. Okay, so their O2 saturation is going to drop. Boom. And they may develop, oh, I'm killing it tonight. Peripheral cyanosis. Why would they develop peripheral cyanosis? Watch it. Watch it. As there's decreased oxygenation, right, the sympathetic nervous system is going to cut off blood flow to the non-vital parts of the body. Tell me you got that, right, to try to maintain blood flow to the core. So when you cut off blood flow, your skin, your nail beds will start getting blue. Say yeah. Okay, so if somebody's having an exacerbation of CHF, what do you want to do? Besides update your Facebook status. You want to sit them up and you want to have them lean over like this to actually take the weight of their chest off so the work of breathing becomes easier. Say yes. You got that. Should they be on a fluid restriction? Yes. Yeah. And you better know this. You got to you got to monitor their um, INO very closely, right? So if they're drinking, they drink a liter of fluid and they're peeing a thimbleful of urine, the doctor needs to be notified that water is going someplace and they need to be diuresed. Say yes, or All right. Now, watch. <clears throat> I'm talking about an acute episode of CHF. Somebody just gets really bad, like they were doing something, like maybe cutting the grass over at my house, trying to get extra credit. And I got CHF. <laughs> and they go into the emergency room. You got me? One of the drugs that they will give them, anybody know it? I, huh? Well, they'll give them, they'll diurese them, but they'll give them another drug. Hang on. Wait.
Wait. Daddy in a letter. <laughs> e. e. Oh wait, there, wait, there's a there's a eye over there. <laughs> oh, okay, there's a E. There's a E. A. No. Uh, no. T. T. Yeah, I did it right. Nitroglycerin. Listen up, because this is true. Nitroglycerin can be given IV. You got me? SL. What does SL mean? So, see, you guys are clinical, man. I like that. And TD. Transdermal. Nice. Transdermal. The nitro patch. We used to do that in uh, ER. We had nothing else to do, so we put nitro patches on CPR dummies and defibrillate them. There's nitroglycerin in it, so it, it will like, make a little explosion. <laughs> Then watch, on slow nights, we put nitro patches on each other and see who would develop a headache first before they'd have to... Oh <laughs> 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 today told me her and her sister, she got a dry um, inhaler and didn't realize it was dry when her and her sister finished. They kept trying it, like, why isn't it working? 30 doses between the two of them, gone. <laughs> and she's like, my heart. Like, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, yeah, you gotta watch that. <laughs> gotta watch that. <laughs> Yeah. Tell me you got that. Now watch. This is really, really important. Do you want a lot of blood coming back to the heart? Did you say yes? Oh, she said no. Good. Yeah, you meant it too. Does it take a while for diuretics to work? Yes, and I'm going to explain to you that when someone's going through an exacerbation of CHF, blood flow to the kidney is actually reduced. So a lot of times, diuretics are not effective. So what's another way that you can reduce preload venous return to the heart? We already did that, and we're leaning them over and everything. Come on. Okay, watch. Watch. You're going to know what this is right away. Oh. What's that? One -way valve. Yep. Look at this one way valve. It's kind of way over here. Watch. And then, here we go. You got muscle. And when you squish, when the muscle contracts, what do you do to the vein? Squish you squish the vein and open that up. So do you want to squish or constrict the veins in someone who has severe CHF? No. Better write this down. Better not pout. Nitroglycerin. Systemic nitroglycerin, IV, transdermal, sublingual, is a potent venodilator. It dilates veins. It promotes the pooling of blood in the veins. Do you follow this? So if the venous blood pools in your legs, will it get back to your heart? No. no. That's why it's given in emergency situations because the effectiveness of diuretics, they're just not there. How many people got that? You also Give them this. What's this? I'm using a lot of abbreviations tonight. That's weird. Cool. 
What is that? No, MS. It's morphine sulfate, right? Morphine sulfate does the same thing. It will dilate veins. That's why morphine sulfate is given to someone who's having a heart attack as well. Because what does, uh, does chest pain hurt? That's why it's called chest pain. So you give them morphine not only to reduce the pain, but also to dilate the veins too, to reduce venous blood to the heart. Say yeah. So when you give somebody nitroglycerin sublingually, what's it going to do to venous return to the heart? It's going to decrease it, right? So what's going to happen to the stretch of the right side of the heart? Decrease. So what's going to happen to the amount of blood ejected with each beat and the pressure with which that blood is ejected? So in some cases, if you give them too much nitroglycerin and they're like standing up when you give it to them, then their blood pressure bottoms out and they fall down. So you never give someone nitroglycerin when they are standing up. Should you give it to them when they're lying down? Flat. Flat. No, you never lay a person with CHF down flat. So you put them in what's called the high fowler's position. You learned that, did you? Where it looks like, I don't know, kind of like a cool chair. It looks actually pretty comfortable. You know, like they're here, and then their feet are kind of like this. Then they, you just kind of push them around the unit. Then you can ambulate to the store. Maybe get a Jimmy John sandwich. Low sodium. That's right. How many people got that? All right. So I'm going to talk more about BMP in a minute. So without looking, what are the drugs used to treat congestive heart failure? Nitro, MS. What else? You talked about it. Diuretics. What's the big dog in diuretics? There you go. And you better know how that works. Dejoxin. What's Dejoxin classified as? Oh, yeah, Carla. Uh-huh. Sitting over there. How does it affect the heart? What's that? And what's that called? You got to start learning these terms, peeps. Inotropic? Yeah, so it's a positive inotropic agent. You better know the mechanism of action, things to look for. What else? Ace and ARBs. Right, ACE and ARBs, right? And what's, what does that do? Is Yeah, who cares? What does it ultimately do? How does it lower blood pressure? Get out and stop <laughs> drinking. <laughs> what does it, how does it reduce preload? The in, inhibition of aldosterone reduces um, preload. How does it, how does it reduce afterload? How do ARBs and ACE inhibitors reduce afterload? They cause what? They're arterial vasodilators, right? Say yes. Tell, say yeah. All right. What else? Does that pretty much cover it? And remember, this is for a dilated, dilated CHF, dilated, where the left ventricle is stretched out, it's weakened. The left ventricular chamber is enlarged. Who's got that? All right. Now, can I show you what they're doing? For people who have end-stage CHF, right, that if they don't get a heart transplant or they don't read the textbook, it's over. This is what they're doing. They are taking part of the lat muscle 
and they're actually wrapping it around the left ventricle. And then they put in a pacemaker where they will paste the ventricles and they will pace that piece of skeletal muscle, that lap muscle. So as the left ventricle weakens, is trying to contract, that lap muscle will contract. And that's end stage. The other thing they have is what's called a left ventricular assist device. Have you ever heard of the left ventricular assist device, uh, the LVAD? Right? So basically what they're doing is they're taking a bunch of the blood that would normally go into this damaged left ventricle and bypassing it in through this left ventricular assist device and it does the pumping. So if you got a left ventricular assist device, you in trouble. Say so yeah. They used to have the left ventricular assist device is the external Jarvik, the artificial heart. So back in my day, they the Jarvik was still FDA approved, so people would have it, and they'd have little tubes going into them, and you could see their heart, the heart beating. I told you about the guy, right? He, his job was to push the, the pump around the ICU. The pump at this time was about like this big. Yeah. Then his blood pressure went so bad that he has, it fried his retinas, so he was blind. And then, uh, he was the only patient I know that got a doctor to write an order for beer. He could have one Coors Light every night. So there was, in our fridge, there was a six-pack of Coors Light because he was from California. They don't drink, you know, light beer uh, like Miller Light. They drink Coors Light. Are you writing that down? That could be a question. Okay. One more medicine they're on. Listen up, because this is true. Anybody got any idea what that medicine would be? I'll give you a hint. If you got a big old left ventricle, and there's a lot of blood in it, and it don't contract so good, what's going to happen to the amount of blood left in that left ventricle each time it beats, the amount of blood left in it, it's going to increase, right? And that blood can settle in the base of the left ventricle. And if it don't move too much, it what? Clots. Clots. So they are typically on some type of anticoagulant as well. Say, yeah. And we know how to monitor, right, anticoagulants? Say yes. OK. All right. Watch. Hang on. I like this urinary system diagram. Who likes that urinary system diagram? This one. You like it? See, if you would have said you liked it, I was gonna, I was willing to give you guys extra credit. I oh, forget it. No, 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 a little too late. Yeah, whatever. Let me get rid of this. I'll give somebody extra credit if they go through each one of my PowerPoints and erase the stuff that I saved. <laughs> That'll take you like nine years. You know, I love the way you guys, you know, just are free with the advice. You know, you think it's easy up here trying to educate you guys, do you? It's a hard job, Anna. Hard job. <laughs> By doing what? Oh. He, he you made my life easier. Watch the <laughs> yeah, you don't. Okay. Do you remember the juxtaglomerular apparatus? Okay. Now watch. Why was Renin released? That's very good. That's very good. So if somebody goes into an exacerbation of CHF because their preload's increasing and their heart's getting overstretched, if it's overstretched more than usual, what's going to happen to the force of that left ventricle? Is it going to be weaker than before or stronger? Weaker. So what's going to happen to the blood pressure? 
it's going to go down. And what's going to happen to the blood pressure in your little juxtaglomerular apparatus? It's going to go down. And when it goes down, watch it. When that blood pressure goes down, it's going to activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. It's going to cause vasoconstriction. It's going to cause aldosterone trying to reabsorb that, that sodium back into the blood. And these people cycle out of control rapidly. That's why for if you know you listen to somebody and at the start of your shift they're they have fluid here and now their heart rate's going up, their pulse ox is dropping, and you can hear fluid in the middle of their lungs. You gotta get your fatty acid on the phone and call the doctor and say, look, we need to diurese this guy because he's filling up. Tell me you got that. And anytime you give Lasix, you have to worry about what electrolyte. Potassium. Right, so you're chasing potassium. When you're giving Lasix, you are chasing that potassium all shift. It'll run around, sometimes under the bed. Chasing. How many people got that? And it will go very, very quickly. I'm talking 10 or 15 minutes. It goes that fast out of control. That's why they have to be monitored quickly. That's why a lot of times the doctors, when they have an exacerbation of the CHF, they'll have them go down to the intensive care unit. It's that bad. How many people you, you're following me? All right. Let me, uh, let me differentiate the dilated CHF with um, the restrictive CHF. Now, I've been tutoring some of the students in clinical. They don't use dilated CHF and restricted CHF. They use dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, don't they? Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to tell you. Watch. The most common cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uncontrolled HTN, H-I-N, uncontrolled high, high blood pressure, long-standing uncontrolled high blood pressure. Watch. What did they tell you? How many people watch like really early in the morning those exercise shows where they tell you, increase the resistance to build muscle? I get up early just to do that. It's working. Do you watch that? The infomercials, you mean? Forget it. Okay. <laughs> How do you get big muscles? If I curl 50 pounds 20 times every day for a year, after a certain point, will my muscle get any bigger or stronger? No. You have to increase the resistance, say yes. So how do people get high blood pressure? Their arteries that were like this now become like this. So they are, the left ventricle has to pump against increased resistance. What does the left ventricle do when it pumps against increased resistance? No. If you start lifting more weights and you increase the resistance, what do your muscles do? If your heart has to work against more resistance, what will the left ventricle do? It will get bigger. It will get thicker. The myocardium becomes thicker. The wall becomes thicker. So this used to all be space. Now it's filled in with thickened muscular wall. They love asking these questions. They love it. They love this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you because I like you. Yes. If a muscle is really thick, that left ventricle is really thick, is it easy to stretch it? So you have a thick 
rigid left ventricle. And the reason that you can't pump out a lot of blood is because you can't fill the ventricle with a lot of blood. So this is referred to, this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is referred to as diastolic heart failure. When does the heart fill with blood? Well, just say it. <laughs> when does the heart fill with blood? When does the left ventricle fill with blood? What phase? Are you, what? <laughs> when does the left ventricle, when does the blood from the left atria go into the left ventricle? When the heart relaxes. When the what? What's that medical term called? The dub. <laughs> yeah, the dub. It's the diastolic phase, okay. right? So because the heart doesn't stretch and you can't fill the heart with a lot of blood, it's referred to as diastolic heart failure. Watch. You can fill this puppy with a lot of blood. It's like a weakened rubber band. It's like I got these old Hanes underwear from like 20 years ago. That elastic band's all over the place, man. You know what I do? I still have them. I take a little duct tape and just put it around it. It's all good. So think of that worn out elastic Hanes underwear or whatever your favorite, Fruit of Laloom maybe. For you women, maybe it's, I don't know, Victoria's Secret. Does that ever stretch out? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give and take here in this classroom. <laughs> so, <laughs> so watch. If the left ventricle stretches out, it will fill, but the problem is because it's overstretched, it doesn't contract really strong. So this is systolic failure. Say yeah. Now, knowing what you know, I'm going to ask you a critical thinking question. I'm really turning into a nursing instructor, huh? K class. What was the question? <laughs> oh, if somebody had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what would you want to do? What would you want to do? Do you want to give them a medicine? that will increase the force of contraction of that left ventricle. Dude, the, the thing's on steroids now, right? It's enlarged. So you want to give you want to be giving them digoxin? No. I don't think so, right? You want to reduce the force of contraction. So calcium. so calcium channel blockers are indicated in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to reduce the force of contraction. The other drug that's given are beta blockers. What do beta blockers block? <laughs> what do they block? What binds the beta receptors? So what does epinephrine do to the force of contraction of the heart? That's very good. So they are given calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. And they're, do you want that heart pumping against blood vessels that are this small or this small? Do you want the resistance to be high or low? Low. So they're also given ACE inhibitors too. Say yeah. And over time, in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, Beta blockers will actually remodel that heart where the left ventricle will actually begin to thin out. Now, if it's really, 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 you know, really bad, then uh, there's not too much they can do. And they usually need a heart transplant or that's the end of the road for them. How many people followed that? And I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this, is that they're going to want you to know the difference between those two and how you treat it. And now you should be able to understand why you do what you do. Do be, do be, do. do be. <laughs> yes or no? Yeah. 
Now, <coughs> watch. How many people have ever tried to put 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. So, watch. If the left atrium is, got, is trying to push a certain amount of blood into this thickened, rigid left ventricle, it ain't going to be able to do it. So that blood that's in the left atria that should be going into the left, at, uh, the left atria should be going in the left ventricle, it starts backing up into the pulmonary veins, pulmonary venules, pulmonary capillaries. Say so, yeah. So these people are managed with calcium channel blockers, vasodilators, and beta blockers. Can I get an amen? All right. Okay. Body does stuff that makes sense, yes? Most days. I'm back to dilated just for a second, okay? Dilated cardiomyopathy. Does your left ventricle get overstretched, Anna? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't right. Anna's not over No, you know what you, she was looking, I'll tell you, like, but if Anna was the board, if Anna was the board, this is what she was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'd, let, I'd love one day is to get a GoPro, right? <laughs> and then show you what I look at. And say, oh yeah, <laughs> that would fire me up too. <laughs> yep. Okay, all right, we'll uh, leave Anna to her daydreaming. What were you thinking about? <laughs> she was thinking about drugs, the ACE inhibitor. She said it. Oh, were you really? Yeah. How do they work? I don't think that kid's buying it. <laughs> okay, so watch. If your left ventricle is overstretched, what could cause it? to be overstretched. And don't say congestive heart failure. I'm talking about something that occurs in the body to make it overstretch. That's a good question. Very good. Increase venous return. That's right. What determines venous, one of the things that determines venous return to the heart? Huh? That's what I said. Blood volume. Blood vo What's blood mostly made out of? Water. Water. So if this heart is overstretched, what's going to happen to the BNP? That's very good. Br what does naturesis mean? Right. What's the medical term or the chemical symbol for sodium. Sure. Cis. BNP affects the distal convoluted tubules. You're not going to believe this. Now, why was BNP released? That's right. And why was it overstretched? Because of increased venous return, right? And one of the things that determines venous return is... And what is blood mostly made out of? Water. So BNP has its effect that is opposite of aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? It stimulates the sodium-potassium pump, don't it? Don't it? Yeah, you're looking at me like, huh? I didn't study that yet. There ain't no test today. Get so, <laughs> B. <laughs> that was a well played. <laughs> we'll get to that on Monday. Because that's what we do. We study before the test. Do you really? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's how you're supposed to answer a question. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but in, but in actuality, yeah. No. And I like to, did you read the chapter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In my general class, I go, did you read? They're like, 
Then in my advanced class, did you read? No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. No reading with here. Don't even ask, Tim. It's ridiculous. It ain't happening. Okay, so watch. Just think for a minute. B and P, do you want sodium that is in the urine to get absorbed into the blood if B and P is around? No. So BNP inhibits the sodium potassium pump and prevents the reabsorption of sodium back into the blood. So it is a, it's a diuretic, but it's a diuretic because it gets rid of sodium and water will follow osmotically. Say yes. Boom, that's BNP. <laughs> Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Did I go over some of the signs and symptoms? Did I? How do you um, how do you assess? What's the best tool to assess whether or not someone has CHF? You can use BMP, but if it's new for that person, how do you if they've never been diagnosed with CHF? How do you know they have CHF? Yeah, but maybe they got a bad cold or asthma or not reading the textbook. Maybe they went tired than they usually do. That's history and physical. Yeah, I'll give you that. Signs and symptoms. But what are the tests that they can use? Stress. Yeah, they'll give you a stress test, right? But remember, with um, congestive heart failure, it's a structural problem typically, right? So what's one of the ways that they can look at somebody's heart, look at the structures within the heart? Echo. They look at, they use echo, right? The best way to look at it, especially with valves, is uh, to laugh at them. Tee -hee -hee. Tee -hee -hee. It's called a transesophageal echo. So they actually put a little tube down their throat into their esophagus and they will use a echo, and you can see valves, especially the aortic and mitral valve, very well. Okay, so I just got a call from a lady I work with. She said her, had, her dad just had a T test. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but whatever. And it showed vegetation on his mitral valve. Was he a heroin addict? He no, he's old and he's dying. He had rheumatic heart disease. So so this T test is what it is. Yep. That's what they'll say. And it looks really good. It's if they suspect aortic or mitral valve problems, then they're going to use a a T um, a T a transesophageal echo. Did you say um, what did you say to the lady? I didn't say what you talking I said, about? I'm so sorry to hear that. No, you said what you what are you talking about? Or you were thinking yeah. yourself? Right. I'm like. Did oh. you did you think like what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> That's a transesophageal echo. So remember, when you look at CHF, if they're suspecting valvular problems, they're going to do an echo. The other thing that CHF or the echo does is it looks at the size of the ventricles. And that will determine whether it's a restrictive CHF or a dilated CHF. And based on that, that will determine the course of treatment. Because both dilated and Restrictive can present clinically the same way. Say yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, who's got the questions? Nobody. Can I see them real quick? Uh, okay, describe, uh, describe, I did 11, 12, 13, 14, yes, mm -hmm. I explained the difference between paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea, mm -hmm. which is worse, that's very good, because they go into failure immediately when they lay down, that's an NCLEX question, yeah, so you got one out of 75, <laughs> okay, 
Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over uh, coronary artery disease. So, yeah. Here's the thing, too. The bottom line is, I don't care where you work, what unit you work on, right? Orthopedics, right? Uh, med surge. People are going to come in with comorbidity. Killing it tonight. I got to use some other big words. But anyways, and the most, the three big ones that they're going to come in with is some type of cardiovascular disease, some type of metabolic disease, right? Diabetes, stuff like that, or um, um, cardiovascular disease. So those are the things. Did I say cardiovascular disease? Respiratory disease. So those are the things that you have to know the best because you're going to see them the most. Okay? All right. Did you watch the video? <laughs> I really need to stop. On when the myocardium yes. receives its blood supply. Yes. When does the myocardium receive its blood supply? During ventricular diastole, right? Okay, so watch. I'm going to show you something. Don't some of these lines, if you look, it looks like they're getting closer to you, don't they? <laughs> if each one of these yellow lines represents ventricular contraction, when is the heart muscle receiving oxygenated blood through the coronary arteries? in between are you with me please say yes, yes. yeah yes. okay good what's rpp rate pressure product i'm down with rpp yeah you know me <laughs> ready you better get this Wait, we better start off slow. <laughs> Watch. Is the heart muscle alive? Yes. Good. We're off to a good start. 74.3. If it's alive, it needs oxygenated blood in order to make ATP for it to contract, correct? What arteries deliver oxygenated blood to the myocardium? The coronary arteries. Say yes. Totally got that, right? Okay, a couple of other things. How do you know your heart's working harder? How do you know it's working harder? Increased heart rate and... And the increased force of contraction is exhibited and can be measured by increase in systolic blood pressure. SBP is systolic blood pressure. Tell me you got that. True or false? When you're exercising, your heart rate and blood pressure go up. Good. So does that mean you need more blood flow going through those coronary arteries? Yeah. That's good. That's really good. We're killing it. That's all I really have to say about corner. All right, come on. Now watch. There's a life. There needs to be a balance, Anna, between paying attention and not paying attention. <laughs> there needs to be a balance between oxygen supply you got me and that's determined by the coronary arteries right who's with me and myocardial 
oxygen demand. Are you with me? So how do you know, how do you determine myocardial oxygen demand? Simpler, how do you know your heart's working harder or less harder? You look at the heart rate and the systolic blood pressure. And what's up when you multiply something, what's it called? Well, that's math. It's called a product. <laughs> Thinking out loud there, huh? So watch. Myocardial oxygen demand, how much oxygen the heart needs, is determined by your heart rate times your systolic blood pressure. That's called rate pressure product. Who's with me? Guys? So if your heart rate and systolic blood pressure go up, what do the coronary arteries have to do? They have to supply more oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And how do they do that? How do they get more blood in it? Nice. The coronary arteries dilate. You knew that, right? That was a new one, I think. I saw a lot of surprised looks, along with looks of indifference. <laughs> Which were the majority. <laughs> How many people got that? Now watch. When myocardial oxygen demand, mod, is greater than coronary, I got nothing, Cor uh, coronary artery, artery supply, Right? When you cannot get enough oxygenated blood to that heart muscle, what does that p part of the heart muscle become? That's good. Say it real loud. That was loud. Say it real loud. I'm still not sure. Ischemic. Ischemic. Right? You, better, you need to know this. Ischemia is lack of blood flow. Lack of oxygen is what? <laughs> Hypoxia. Tell me you got that. Now, if you are ischemic, are you always hypoxic? Yes, because the blood carries the oxygen. If you are hypoxic, are you always ischemic? No. Right? Maybe somebody stuck a dirty, dirty dish rag down your throat. So you're pumping blood, you just ain't got no oxygen in it. Say yes. But if you're ischemic, lacking blood flow, you're always hypoxic. Now watch. Remember when you were in third grade, you took that rubber band wrapped around your finger? Right? And you kept it there until your finger started turning like pale, then it started turning blue, and then it started to hurt. When you lack blood flow, it causes pain. Say yeah. Now, you're going to look up these terms. You're going to do some work outside of this class besides not look at the videos. <laughs> what more do you want us not to do? You, you need to know uh, the difference between these two uh, situations, right? One is um, Okay, 
It's not angina, because it's not vagina. <laughs> it's angina. It depends on where you're from, though, I guess. <laughs> on the East Coast, they have vaginas. <laughs> uh, who's with me here? Stable and unstable angina. You need to be able to differentiate those two and understand them. I'll, um, I'll explain that. All right. Or stable ischemic heart disease. Or unstable ischemic heart disease. Right? They go by a bunch of terms. Nurses love using terms. You ever notice that? Like when we watch the... Watch. You can always, like if you watch Joey Bag of Donuts, you can always tell when he's going to lie. His mouth is moving. But when he's really going to lie and make up a, a whopper, he starts using big terms. Peripheral vessels. Oh. Anyways, how many people followed this so far? All right, here we go. I want this whole thing. You're going to have to understand this pointed questions here, people. Did I ever tell you the story? December 22nd, 1986. Did I tell you that story? It was like 1.30 in the afternoon. This little lady, she was 83 years old, comes in the emergency room complaining of chest pain. So I hook her up to the monitor, right? Take her blood pressure, and then... I get a 12 lead on her, and I see what I'm going to explain to you in a little bit. I'm like, oh, no. So I call the ER doc in. Then the, their attending comes in, right? And they're monitoring their blood pressure. And uh, I, uh, st they stabilized her, and then they, I transferred her to the ICU. And she said to me, will I have to spend Christmas in the hospital? And I said, no. And she goes, oh, I'm so happy about that. So... I got her settled in the ER, and then I hear cold blue, or cold four ICU, and I called up. I go, that was my little old lady, wasn't it? And they said, yeah, she coded and died. She had uh, what's called the uh, Widowmaker, the left anterior descending artery completely occluded. And uh, uh, that affects the electrical conduction system in the heart, so she wanted to end up ventricular fibrillation. There was nothing you could do, you know? And I, was, I remember that day because I was getting on a plane to come home for the holiday, and my shift was done at 3.30, so she came in at like at 1.30. That was like, what, 31 years ago? I still remember her, too. Um, okay, what was I going to show you now? I know. Yeah, yeah, look, I know, I know exactly what I'm doing. You just don't, it just doesn't look like it. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. This always looks like a raspberry to me. Doesn't it? Okay. A couple of things. How many main coronary arteries do you have? Two. You have the left and right main coronary artery. Which artery, left or right, has a larger average diameter? Why would you say the left? Which side of the heart has to work harder, the left or the right? So the left side of the heart, specifically the left ventricle, has to work harder, so therefore it needs a greater amount of oxygenated blood, say yaba. Okay. So, and remember, when the left ventricle contracts, the aortic valve opens up, blocks those little openings, but when the left ventricle relaxes, the valve closes, and then that blood flows through the coronary arteries to feed the heart muscle. That's very important that you understand that. Yes? Okay. All right. Where does arterial blood always go? That's very good. All right. Now watch. Does a red blood cell have a steering wheel on it? You ever see some of those? <laughs> so, watch. I'm a red blood cell in a coronary artery. Nice straight one. But 
to go this way, I gotta bounce into the wall. When you bounce red blood cells off the wall of the coronary artery, you damage it. That's why many of the plaque, the cholesterol buildup in coronary arteries, occurs at bifurcations where those coronary arteries split. Who's with me? So I'm gonna outline this a little bit for you. And then I'm going to show you a video, okay? You ready? Now watch. For people to develop coronary artery disease, you must first damage. Damage. The inner lining of the artery, the coronary artery. CA is coronary artery. You got me? What's the inner lining of an artery called? That's the hole. Ooh, that's very close, but it's actually got a name. It's Billy Bob. <laughs> it's called the intima. All right? Watch. When you damage the intima, the inner lining of the coronary artery, Let's say you damage it right here. And I'll show you a video in a minute. I just want to give you a little heads up here. When you damage that, you will get an immune response. Right? Anytime you damage tissue, you get an immune response. Response. And what will happen is in that damaged area, LDL cholesterol will begin to accumulate in that area. And it begins to accumulate over decades. Do you have cholesterol buildup in your coronary arteries? Do you? Do I? No, I don't think so, Nancy. No, I don't. No, you know what? Teach at a technical college. Yeah, I got cholesterol buildup in mine, right? You probably do too. You do. But the amount of buildup in that cholesterol, that cholesterol buildup in that coronary artery is no big deal because know this, the heart muscle is unique compared to any other muscle in the body. It's able to extract about 90% of the oxygen that's delivered to it. Skeletal muscles on its best day can extract about 70%. So the myocardium has that ability to take minimal amounts of blood flow and still get enough oxygen so you don't get any symptoms. Know this, that at 90% blockage of a coronary artery, you will only get symptoms typically when you exert yourself because the heart, even that minimal amount of blood flow, you still are able to get enough oxygen to the heart muscle. That's why I watch, watch. That's why I showed you that picture. And I'll show you and it'll make perfect sense. When is the heart muscle getting its blood flow? So when people are sitting on their fatty acid, and their heart isn't demanding a lot of blood through those black coronary arteries. Are they having any symptoms? Somebody's having symptoms. <laughs> so watch. So if a doctor suspects that you may have heart disease, we're gonna give you a stress test. So what happens to your heart rate when you get a stress test? What happens to your blood pressure? So the amount of time that the coronary arteries are getting filled is smaller and the demand is higher. So it will rear its ugly head on a stress test. Yeah, order tickets to Noah's Ark, man. And I'm, 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 I'm weighing it down here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, order them, we'll wait. 
How many people followed that? No, for real, did you get that? That's why you can't look at somebody, yeah, yeah, 90% occlusion. They give them a stress test and they will start becoming, they may not even become symptomatic, but the EKG will show evidence that they have blockages in their coronary arteries. Yep. My You know what, uh, especially guys, guys don't want to admit it because, look, we're tough. I ain't going to die. I'm just going to one day just explode from cool. Um, and they're not willing to admit it. And most people don't think that they get indigestion, right, or maybe a little heartburn, and they let it go. And you need, um, you need about, it's about four hours, that little magic window, that if you don't get treated within four hours, that heart muscle is going to die. So even if you, if you don't think it is, if you think it, like you're feeling kind of weird, get it tested. And for women, too, women don't get pain. They just inflict it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm editing that out just so you know. Um, but... Women will have symptoms of like depression, just not feeling right. And because back in the day, most doctors were men. Now, like, ah, you know, being a typical, you know, woman, here, here's some, here's some, uh, you know, anti anxiety medications, when in fact, they were having a heart attack. So they will feel depressed. Just not, the complaint most often given is they just didn't feel right. Now, because more women are cardiologists, are working that up, and they're finding women who have, are having heart attacks. And know this, estrogen only protects you while you have it. Once you don't have estrogen anymore, then your chances of developing a heart attack are equal to that of a man. Yeah, it actually is. I think, you know, because, you know, they're always upset about something. You know, that epinephrine. <laughs> <laughs> so Can, if you just feel weird all the time you're probably having a heart attack all the time that would be my guess I think I've felt normal since I know mid 90s <laughs> <laughs> um, okay uh, here I'll give you a break but uh, let me ask you a question uh, it's off topic um, so I bought a house without my girlfriend looking at it and now she's upset <laughs> it's your house right right <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I'm gonna live in that one. I'm gonna rent out my old one. So she. Did she come and rent you? I don't know. <coughs> Is she mad because you didn't ask her? To move <laughs> no, I didn't. No, like I don't know. <laughs> Never know. Okay, here we go. Video time, people. There's Jacqueline Morris. What is this? <laughs> Judge Joe Brown. Oh, I love watching that. Who was on that? <laughs> she was on Judge Joe Brown? Uh -huh. Protecting womanhood and promoting manhood. <laughs> you know, you have to be an absolute total brain donor to piss off a judge. <laughs> Just so you know, this guy right here, that was me. All right? Then I started teaching at Gateway. Iron swing versus driver swing. Want to look at that? That's Dr. J. You know who Dr. J is? Who is Dr. J? What's his name? Yeah, you don't even know nothing. I know. Yeah. Wait, what am I doing? Hey, anyone who want to test me for some extra credit while I'm looking for this video? Look up the starting lineup for the Chicago Cubs, 1973 to 1980. Give me a, a starting player number, our name. I'll give you his number. Pitchers, too. Go ahead. I dare you. Yeah, yeah I dare you. Seventy-three to eighty. 
81 maybe, 82 maybe, maybe even 83. Um, yeah. Just look for the big white throw. <laughs> Did I show you my the picture? Me? No. I never showed you that? I've never seen the picture. You don't want to. You want to, what kind of person do you want? Chicago Cubs starting lineup. Right. 73 to 80. I got 73. All right, go ahead. Give me a player. Uh, starting lineup. If I get it wrong, I I'll give you extra credit. Huh? Who? Bert Hooten. Uh, Bert Hooten was 44. Dave LaRoche. Oh, LaRoche. Dave LaRoche, 17. Vic Harris. Vic Harris. Ooh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll tell you, Vic Harris. Vic Harris, he was a black guy, probably in the 70s, right? He had a big fro underneath his hat. You got a picture of him? No. Oh. He's a second baseman, right? 1974. Yeah, 74. Second baseman. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> Okay, give me, is it in the teens? No. It's single digits? Mm -hmm. Four. Seven. Ah. Oh. I can't see him playing. Give me another one. Well, he did wear four, but he, in 1974, oh. he was seven. He did wear number four. See, you didn't get it right. <laughs> but no, in 1974. He I, I couldn't tell you. I, I didn't know the year. I mean, cut it out. I knew he wore four. <laughs> Mill Pappas, 32. Juan Bizarro. I got us. I got it. Is he in the 40s? Oh, God. I, I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to get it wrong. I don't know why this keep 47. Close. What is it? Six. God. Horatio Pena. <laughs> Horatio Pena? Horatio Pena. Yeah. Yeah, he was a side armor. Right handed pitcher. Um, Horatio Pena. Oh, wait. I think I know this one. Uh, 37 or 38? What was he? Devil's in the detail. No. What do you read? I was 10 years old back then. No, 11. What do you remember at 11? Wait, what number did he say? He used to pick my nose. <laughs> what, what, what is it? And I'll tell you if I said it. No, what number did he say? I don't know. 37. Wrong. What is it? <laughs> Bump Wills. That's Maury Wills' kid. I can see him playing. Hold up. Hold up. This is 82. Man, I can see it. I'll tell you right now. It's it's in the teens. I know that. And I can see him. And I want to say, I want to say it's either 17 or 19. No. no, I can just see them playing. I have to be able to picture them playing. He was second baseman. His dad was Maury Wills. Yeah, I know that didn't help. Pete Lecoq. Pete Lecoq, number eight. Just so you know, a little uh, tidbit of information. Uh, Gary Marshall, the guy who was in the Hollywood Squares, the... Uh, Marshall's dad. That, no, that's Pete Lecoq's dad. Pete Lecoq. Lecoq is not a good name if you're on TV. Yeah. <laughs> and Peter Lecoq. Right? I knew a guy in middle school. His name was Slavon Diglick. What? what? 
slobbing on dick lick? Did he commit suicide from being just constantly, you know, badgered? <laughs> My buddy's name is Rod Dick, and his dad's Harry. <laughs> That's child abuse. Life is tough enough. I knew a guy uh, down in Dallas. His first name was Queen. Queen. <laughs> then I had a lady come in, bring her daughter. It was, uh, her first name was Chlamydia. Oh, oh my God. I'm not lying. Cl there was a Chlamydia vulva. Oh, my God. Right? Urethra. <laughs> it just sounds exotic. <laughs> we had a patient, and his girlfriend's name was Kitchiana. And I guess that was because she was born in the kitchen. <laughs> what? I got to tell you. Okay, here we go. The pathophysiology of coronary artery disease. I'm going to ask again pointed questions. Say yes. What is LDL cholesterol? What is it? Bad what? Oh. <laughs> okay. What? what? Li lipid. F fat. Tell me you got that. So when you damage the inside of the coronary artery, the first thing that's going to occur is you're going to get that immune response, and then you're going to get the buildup of LDL cholesterol. So you will develop what are called fatty streaks. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. How many people <laughs> like having fatty streaks? No? <laughs> Fatty streaks in a steak? Yeah. Oh. How come I ain't got no epic pen? Well, look. Look. I'm closing this one out. What the? All right, well, son of a. I quit. All of you. Yeah. All right, hang up. Yeah, there we go. How do I do this? Why won't this work? Where is it? Where's the epic pen? Is this it? <laughs> Son of a. So what? Watch. So over time, I'll I'll draw it. Over time, this LDL cholesterol, uh oh, <laughs> right? It'll start building up, right, over the decades. Mm -hmm. Now, because it's fat and gooey, the body does stuff that makes sense. So what will happen is it will actually put a protein coat over that fat to kind of stabilize it. This is what's referred to as a stable clot. Right? A stable, not a clot, a stable plaque. Right? You got the fat in here. It's covered, of, like I like to refer it as like a scab. Tell me you got that. Now, remember and write this down. It's the clot that kills you. Write this down. In arteries, blood likes to flow in a laminar fashion, a layered fashion. But as that artery becomes obstructed and and cholesterol's building up. Who's with me? Blood will begin to flow turbulently. And turbulent blood flow clots. So watch. He was doing, uh, Tim Russell was the guy on um, Face the Nation, right? He was the moderator. So I actually saw it happen. He went like this. <gasps> and then when he sneezed, it blew that plaque right off. Now watch, when the plaque ruptures, a clot forms. And when the clot forms, blood flow is cut off. If you don't reestablish blood flow to that part of the heart, that part of the heart dies, and you will suffer a myocardial infarct. Say yes. So what are the symptoms of a myocardial infarct that you're having 
a heart attack. Chest pain. Where's the chest pain? In the chest. In the chest. I know. Are you writing that down? Where does the pain go? Down the arm and? And into the neck and the left side of the jaw. Do you know why? No. Well, who cares? Okay, watch. The nerves of yeah, watch. I'm going to show you something. Well, maybe I'm not. I'm not searching. Why not? Where is this? Wait, it's emphatic. Watch. Ready? What's a um, what's an area of the skin that uh, is innervated by a specific spinal nerve called? Section. Oh, good. A dermatome. Are you with me? Now watch. T1 and T2 innervate the chest, the inside of the left arm, and the left side of the neck and jaw. So when people get chest pain, the pain tends to radiate up the neck and jaw and down the left arm. Say yes. Because that pain signal is being transmitted by T1 and T2 thoracic sensory nerves. Tell me you're with me. Right? So they're going to get chest pain. How do they describe it? Like if somebody, you're doing triage in an emergency room and somebody comes in and says, I'm having chest pain, what, what would you ask them? How, what kind of chest pain? In my chest. Describe it. Describe okay, it. right? So if they say, I'm having pain, right? Right there. Are they having a heart attack? Chances are probably not. Because you need to understand this. Visceral pain, gut pain, is much more diffuse, right? It's spread out, and it can be referred. It can be referred to the epigastric area. That's why a lot of people think they're having indigestion. Mm -hmm. Say, yeah. Or they feel like their shoulder's hurting or their neck's hurting when it's actually their heart. And it tends to be a crushing pain. People describe it like somebody's sitting on my chest. Say, yeah. Now, what's one of the ways that you can differentiate chest pain and differentiate it from musculoskeletal pain and true cardiac pain. What could, how could you do that? You right, you ask them to take a big, big deep breath, right? Does the pain increase, decrease, or stay the same? If it increases, then it's probably chest wall related. Cardiovascular heart pain does not increase or decrease with breathing. The other thing you'll see physicians do is the, when the patient's sitting there, they'll actually take their hand and push on their chest. Does that hurt? Does it make it hurt more? Because that way it will determine if you've got what's called costal chondritis. you got those little connections between the sternum. Say yaba. Okay. What other the other signs and symptoms? Does pain make you want to go to bed? No. I'm having pain, so I'm going to go to bed. Right? So what nervous system is stimulated? My name is? The sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. What does that do to your heart rate? <coughs> what does that do to the force of contraction and therefore systolic blood pressure? What does that do to your anxiety? Right? What happens to? Sweating. Say yeah. So they'll be diaphoretic, <laughs> shaky, heart rate's high. Will they be short of breath? If the heart ain't pumping, good. They'll be short of breath. Chest pain, again, that's referred. Who's with me? Okay, now, ooh, who get this? I'm going to show you electrocardiographically. The difference between ischemia that can be reversed and infarct that cannot be reversed, death of heart muscle. Watch. Can you see this? 
how come uh, everyone remembers everyone remembers the EKG right mm -hmm. you do yeah well we're gonna see I can't even see this what's this little blip called right then you got this little delay and then you have what QRS. what does the QRS represent yeah then you have the T wave what does the T wave represent Repolarization of what? Of both ventricles. Okay. So watch. And you're going to get this. You better learn this. Rebecca, are you going to learn this? All right. Because Rebecca, I don't think she was paying attention. Anna, clearly not. So I'm going to make sure I have many questions on this. My name is... Ready? One of the things, one of the parts of the EKG that is most sensitive and shows ischemia is this portion here. This is the QRS, and this is the T wave. This little segment right here from the end of the QRS, the end of the QRS to the beginning of the T wave is called the ST segment. The ST segment shows if a person is experiencing ischemia or infarct. Are you with me? Now look, on an EKG, you have this baseline right here. You see this? As you can see, the ST segment is at the baseline, right? The ST segment's on the baseline. If a part of the heart is lacking blood flow, they're ischemic. I guarantee it. There's going to be a question on this. Maybe ten. If they're ischemic, the ST segment drops below the baseline. You have ST segment depression, and ST segment depression is an EKG criteria of ischemia or lack of blood flow? Say yes. Now watch. I don't know if you know this or not. Probably shouldn't tell you this, but I used to be a photographer, professional. Yeah. I took Babe Ruth, that famous shot, where he's the last day, right? 1951. Okay, watch, watch. <clears throat> Joey, you're going to be the heart. Okay, watch. When they do a 12 EKG, they put the electrodes around here. Tell me you got that. So what it does essentially is each electrode takes a picture of the heart from a different angle. You got that. Mm -hmm. So based on these changes in the EKG, which leads are showing that ST segment depression, that will determine which artery is blocked. So from an EKG, a good cardiologist can determine which artery may be blocked. That's why they do a 12 lead on someone who comes in with chest pain. Say yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> ischemia can be reversed. You're lacking blood flow. The artery is not blocked. You're lacking blood flow. So what do you want to do for this person who is upset, scared, anxious? You give them oxygen right if the heart if the coronary artery is blocked right if it's the hole is smaller you got to deliver more oxygen a greater concentration of oxygen through that smaller hole tell me yes they're anxious oh yeah. if I was anxious or upset and I was in pain what would you want? A, 
a pain reliever. So what would you give them? What's the best pain reliever you know? You give them morphine. You give them oxygen. You give them nitroglycerin. Little dabble do you under the tongue? Why do you give them nitroglycerin? Do you want that heart working harder if it's lacking blood flow? One of the things that determines how hard heart look <laughs> how hard the heart is working is venous return to the heart. What does nitroglycerin do to venous return to the heart? You better get this right. How does it decrease it? It dilates the veins. It causes pooling of blood in the veins. Say yes. And you better write this down. Who's writing it down? Oh, I ain't got no epic pen. I'm going to write it down here. Write this down. And I'm not even going to write it. I'm just going to say it in pig Latin. Watch. Nitroglycerin also dilates coronary arteries. It's a potent coronary artery vasodilator. So by dilating the coronary arteries, you're going to increase coronary blood flow. And by dilating the veins, you're going to be decreasing myocardial oxygen demand. The heart won't be working as hard. Say yes. Now, if you think they're having a grabber, right, where the artery is actually blocked due to a blood clot, What's the first things that have to stick together for a blood to clot to form? What? No. Platelets. And what medicine can you take that prevents platelets from sticking together? Aspirin. Aspirin. That's why, watch, if you jo watch Joey Bag of Donuts videos, you probably heard of this Mona. Have you heard of Mona? Morphine, oxygen, nitro, aspirin. Best thing you can. Boom. Now watch. Timmy don't say, what does Mona mean on a quiz? Timmy's going to ask you why you give morphine, why you give oxygen, why you give nitro and why you give aspirin. Say yes. Now, ischemia <coughs> is lack of blood flow. You got me? Ischemia doesn't mean blood flow is completely cut off. When you get complete block, I'm, I'm going to say it real slow. I'm going to make sure this is When you get complete blockage, complete obstruction of a coronary artery, you got me? You get a classic sign on the EKG. You get ST segment elevation. ST segment elevation is a sign that that coronary artery is completely blocked. And if that blood flow is not reestablished, that heart <coughs> muscle will die. Say yes. And it's called ST segment elevation with convex blowing. It looks like somebody's taking the ST segment and going, blowing it up. It's also called the fireman's sign because it looks like a fireman's hat. See? Or it's also my favorite. My favorite 
is called Tombstone T-Waves. Rest in peace. Tell, tell me you got that. Now, watch, and I'm not going to get into this. Did I tell you I'm going to be teaching a, um, a 12 lead EKG course like the last three weeks of August? Did I tell you that? No. Yeah, it's free, by the way. I'm doing it uh, out of the kindness of my heart. When? Here at Gateway Technical College in Kenosha, though, because I live in Kenosha. How do you sign up for it? Uh, you email me like the first week of August, and I'll tell you when it is, and then you come. And I will teach you how to read a 12 lead EKG with one eye tied behind your back. <laughs> I'm not even playing. All right? So watch. Hang on. Can I show you? Can I show you this real quick? Even though you're not going to be required, I'm not going to test you on this. Can I show you this? You're not happy about that, I can tell. So what? Indulge me just a little bit, trying to educate you. Wait, I'm going to use Rebecca's thing. Thank you. Does that bother you? I bet you it does, huh? Well, yeah, well, hard cheese, uh, sister. Hard cheese. There we go. Look at I made this EKG thing. Look. Oh yeah. Look. Look at the lead. See? Yeah. And you got to do with a bare chest, and because he's got something going on there. Where is it? Why do they put a lead on the leg and on the wrist? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. Okay. This is a twelve lead. You got me? And it's a 12 lead because it has 12 leads. The weird thing is that only, you only have 10 electrodes placed on a 12 lead. And when you, if you take my class, and for $50, I'll tell you. Now watch. Oh, okay. Well, you know, there's the, uh, the cost of you know, renting the room. You know, it's taxes. Okay, <laughs> now watch. What a doctor will do is if you have a blockage in a particular artery, it will show up as ST segment elevation in one or a two of these leads. And you don't know this yet, but when you learn this, though where that ST segment elevation is will indicate what part of the heart is being affected and therefore what coronary artery is being blocked. That's why they do a 12 lead. Say yes lead. Mm -hmm. Now, watch. When people have a heart attack, there are very few people who died because part of their heart muscle died. Do you understand that? People die because of arrhythmia. The electrical conduction system of the heart is produced by living cells within that heart muscle. Say yes. So if you are ischemic or those cells are dying, the electrical conduction system of the heart's gonna be jacked up. And the most common arrhythmia following myocardial infarct is ventricular fibrillation. That's why they have a defibrillator there, because people know what's the most common arrhythmia after a heart attack when people are dead? Ventricular fibrillation. And the earlier you defibrillate, the better chances they have of surviving. Say yeah. So just real quick. So little old lady that I took care of 30 some years ago, she had ST segment elevation in V1, V2, and V3. This is what's called an anterior wall myocardial infarct. And the left anterior descending artery supplies the anterior wall and the electrical conduction system. That's how I knew she was going to die. That's why it's called the widow maker, because it will affect the electrical conduction system and bam. They don't make it. Say so, yeah. <laughs> now the best MI, if you're going to have an MI, is a um, inferior wall MI, and you see that in these leads here. Tell me you got that. 
And if you take the class, I'll show you how uh, you can look at an EKG and determine if somebody had an old heart attack. Like a doctor will look at it and say, oh, they've had an old inferior wall MI. Or if you've ever looked at the interpretation of an EKG, it says, old inferior wall MI. Right? You, you ever look at that? Well, go look at it. And then for extra credit, pronounce this guy's last name. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Well, you ain't getting no extra credit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tell me you followed that. Okay, so know why you give the drugs. And remember, this Mona, this is acute myocardial infarct or ischemic heart disease. They're coming in into the emergency room. That, they don't take morphine every day. Well, maybe they do. Nowadays. You got me? That's the emergency medical management of someone with ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarct. That's the initial treatment. I think there's a question there that says, what's the initial treatment? Say, oh. yeah. Okay, so when you give them the nitro, do you want them laying down? Why? Why don't you want them laying down? Because you don't want that much blood going back to the heart. You go, girl. I was going to demonstrate it by taking a swig off my dive Mountain Dew. <laughs> if your heart is damaged, one of the ways you can make it work harder is by adding more blood back to it. Do you want a lot of venous blood going back to the right side of the heart? No. So that's why you sit them up. And you don't stand them up, do you? No. There you have it. So you put them in some kind of Fowler's <laughs> position or something. That's a new one, some kind of Fowler's <laughs> position. <laughs> <laughs> Got his arms like this. Okay. Um, did, did I do that? Right? Did I explain that to you? All right. Now, what are the laboratory tests that you could use to determine if somebody's having a myocardial infarct? Well, I don't know. The what, Ahana? BMP, just keep using syllabuses or syllables. Come on. Yeah. Watch. I don't care, so what? Watch. Bunch of haters. Wait, son of a... I don't even like this. What the... Watch. This is muscle contraction. Skeletal muscle contraction and cardiac muscle contraction are almost identical. If I had an Epic pen, I could really show you, but I'm going to show you now. These little things that look like partially chewed banana bubblicious bubblegum, this is the troponin complex. Troponin I and troponin T. If your heart cells are healthy, where should troponin I and troponin T be? If the heart cells are damaged due to lack of blood flow, the heart cell membrane ruptures, and what spills into the blood? <laughs> Tell me, yeah. you got that. And these troponins, are specific for the heart. Say yeah. And over the last probably 20, 25 years, these been, they've come into prominence and they're the most sensitive and specific in determining if somebody's had a myocardial infarct. Now watch. You'll measure them, actually measure the levels in the blood. So the higher the levels of troponin I and troponin T, 
What does that mean? The more the heart muscle has died, more cells have died, and more of it's dumped into the blood. That's why they can say, yeah, Grandma had a little heart attack, or Elizabeth, I'm coming. It's the big one. <laughs> say, tell me you got that. Those are the lab tests that they use. There's also CPKMB in myoglobin. Yeah, look those up. You can do something. Troponin, I know, right? Yeah. I come to class, what more you want out of me? I'm in college. <laughs> I'm cutting my grass today, and I hear these kids coming home. They're like in elementary school. I got homework in two classes. It's like, they're like treating us like we're in college. <laughs> I kid you not. Yeah. I go, do you guys read? Are you kidding me? I'm getting ready to go to Gateway. <laughs> I, I heard if you read, they kick you out. How many people <laughs> how many people followed that? Those are the lab tests. Say yeah. Okay. Now if somebody had a myocardial infarct or listen up. They didn't have a heart attack, but they knew that they had buildup of cholesterol in their arteries. What are the drugs that you would want to place a person on? Come on. So I'm going to explain the question. The routine medical management for someone with known coronary artery disease or post-myocardial infarct Oh, I'm killing it today. Baby aspirin. What else, Bryn? <laughs> okay, it may not be it may not be just baby aspirin, but it will be some type of um, anticoagulant. Remember, it's the clot that kills you, right? So you want to make sure that that blood doesn't clot because know this: if a person has one blockage in a coronary artery that's pretty significant. They probably have other blockages in the coronary arteries, right? It just goes, stands to reason. Um, okay, now watch. This is this critical thinking question. And Rebecca, you know what? You're going to get this one. You had this look like, this guy, he ain't going to get nothing on me. Watch. If you have blockages in your coronary arteries, cholesterol buildup, or you've had a heart attack, do you want your heart working hard? How do you know your heart's working hard? Your heart rate and your blood pressure. Say yes. What drug do you know that lowers both the chronotropic and inotropic effect of the heart? Uh, Jessica, give him such a pinch. <laughs> Dig increases the force of contraction. You don't want that, do you? No. no. So what drug are almost all people with known coronary artery disease or post-MI? They've had a heart attack. What are they placed on? A what, uh-huh? Okay, yeah, that ain't what I'm looking for because that don't lower your heart. Great. Uh, uh. Just keep naming the only. <laughs> beta blockers. Who said that? Who said it? The reason I was late, and I'll be honest, is I just got another letter from Indiana. I was declared illegally deaf there. So, and I'm actually, I'm appealing that. So it's beta blockers because what do beta blockers block? <laughs> epinephrine. What does epinephrine do to your heart rate and the force of contraction of your heart? Boom. So this is 
drug number uno, right? When managing someone post MI or who's at significant risk for developing a heart attack is you give them beta blockers because beta blockers reduce the workload on the heart. Listen up because this is true. Your heart is as strong as it's ever going to be. It's not going to get stronger. Do you understand that? It's not. So why do they send you to cardiac rehab? And you know what you want to say? To make your heart stronger. <laughs> Go to counseling. Or watch... Uh, the, yeah, Dr. <laughs> Phil. Yeah. That guy's an idiot. He is. Catch me outside. Oh, please. He's. <laughs> what? Dr. Phil? Uh, catch me outside chick. She just needs Cash me outside chick? Yeah. You had this conversation in this class already. Who's cash me outside <laughs> chick? Exactly the same conversation that we just had. <laughs> You know what? How does that feel? How does that feel? Watch. <laughs> right? And then students, they get so mad. I'll, I'll ask them, I go, uh, hold you. Where do you work? Tim, we had this conversation last week. I go, how does it feel? <laughs> okay, cardiac rehab is actually hormonal rehab. But if the doctor said, I'm going to send you to hormonal rehab, right? Didn't look at you. Right? I'm sending you to cardiac rehab. All right? Now watch. There's a um, Tour de France bicycle racer. His name is Miguel Enderain. His resting heart rate is 23. He's obviously not taking pathophys at Gateway Technical College. It's 23, right? In sports, why did they always say, this team's got players with eight, eight players with playoff experience, and this team doesn't have any? So I'm picking these guys. Why did they always talk about playoff experience? Why did they talk about that? Why? Why is experience. Why is it good to have experience doing something? But why does it make you better? All right, I'll give you. Clearly. Watch, watch. How many people had speech? I believe in the <laughs> death penalty. <laughs> you got me? Then you make sure you put your sheer antiperspirant, right? Because you're pitting out to here. Am I right? So if you're unfamiliar with a particular situation, that is going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and say yes. So what's going to happen to your heart rate and the force of contraction? Boom. If you are unfamiliar with exercise, your response, your body's response to that exercise is going to be stressful. But if you continue to do it over and over again, your body will adjust and it will be less stressful. So people who are in good shape secrete less epinephrine. That's why the resting heart rate is lower. Just tell me you got that. So when you go to cardiac rehab, you do it to blunt the effects of epinephrine. That's why exercise is nature's beta blocker. Boom. People who exercise perceive life as less stressful. Miguel Enderain, he lost a leg. And you're like, that's okay. All right? My resting heart rate's only 24 now. But they do. People who um, are in good shape, psychologically, they perceive life as less stressful. 
So the the example I you, you ever see the movie Dirty Harry? Right? You right. You guys didn't. But anyways, he's eating a hot dog and shooting a bank robber. Right? And then he gets a woman partner and she pulled her gun for the first time and she's like because she's never done it. He's done it a million times, right? So he is trained. The first time I taught a class, right? I had I had a white sports shirt on and a tie and everything. And then I went in and make sure nothing's in my teeth, my zipper's up. And I look, and I am pitted out to here. And I'm like, oh, God. So I had to put on a sport jacket, right? So I go into class, and I'm like, oh, my God. I don't even know what to say, right? <laughs> and then it hit me. And this is, what the beaut this is the beauty of it. You don't know the questions to ask me to make me look bad. Do you understand? I know this much more than you, but that's enough not to look bad. That's why I don't get scared anymore. Right? I've been doing it for 15 years, right? It's like I could fall asleep right now. I'm so parasympathetically activated. <laughs> <laughs> but you see the young teachers, you can tell a teacher for the first time, like, and they get really fret off. Oh. I'm like, forget it. What? Who? Oh, yeah. What's her name? What does she teach? Uh, yeah, alterations. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. See, you, sometimes you want new teachers because they usually try to go a little easier on you because they don't want to flunk everybody and look bad. She flunked everybody? The whole clinical? Yeah. Was it bad? Yeah. Did you have to read it, uh, the book in advance? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if she had your classes because the way she explained things, I'm like, that sounds like to me. I wonder if she had too. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, she says she read it. What's her name? The last name's the breath. But she's made it's Kelly. Oh, Kelly. Something. Oh, maybe she did. They hire a bunch of old gateway people. You know. I graduated from Gateway like in the horticulture pro program. <laughs> yeah, sitting and listening to you was fine. Sitting and listening to her for three hours, it was like... It's really not fine listening to me. I don't, I'm, I'm, I just can't believe you show up. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> and I get paid. Hannah got our things way too quickly, so you can't follow it other than her clinical. And when we did the pre-conference for the HPS, she went through things so fast, I'm like, okay, wait, wait. Oh, really? You know what? Um, I always remember where I started. I will never forget that. I remember what it was like not to know. Do, do you know what I mean? And I... I, I <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like... And I always remember the sticking points for me, the things that were hardest for me, right? But what I learned is that if you understand the pathophysiology, you know why they do things. Honestly. I don't I never have to write a care plan. I don't. Because if I'm taking care of someone and I know the path, I know what to do for them. Do you get that? So drink the Kool-Aid and whatever. Okay? So anticoagulants, beta blockers, yes. Come on. Well, I yelled. I yelled. What what? If can people with with blockages in their coronary arteries still get ischemia and chest pain? Yeah. Yes. So you want to be able to reduce that chest pain and not be sticking them with morphine all the time. So what could you give them that would dilate the coronary arteries? That don't dilate no coronary arteries. <laughs> Nitro. Nitro. Say yo. What are the comp uh, side effects of nitroglycerin? They're a venodilator and they dilate coronary arteries. Do they just dilate the coronary arteries? No, no they dilate all the arteries. Does your skull move? 
Does it go in and out? No. So it will dilate arteries that supply oxygenated blood to the skull. So one of the side effects of nitroglycerin is a pounding headache. See ya. What's another side effect of nitroglycerin? Orthostatic hypotension. What determines the amount of blood pumped by the left heart, Kevin? For $8 and this mouse. By the left heart? Yeah. Okay. What determines the amount of blood pumped by the right heart? Oh, you did it. I don't have eight bucks. You can have that mouse. I could care less. <laughs> now watch. If you add less venous blood back to the right heart, what happens to the stretch? What happens to the force of contraction? And pressure. If there's less blood in the right heart, there's now less blood in the left, so what's going to happen to the force of contraction and blood pressure? Boom. And how do you get venous blood back to the heart? What's one way you can get it back to the heart? Ambulation. What else? Put your feet up. So watch. What happens to venous return when you're laying down and you stand up? Immediately. What happens to venous return? And if you're taking nitroglycerin, it causes those veins to dilate even more. So when you stand up, boom, all that blood pools in your veins and you get orthostatic hypotension. Yeah, you know I explained that good, Rebecca. You know I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's with me? What caused the plaque buildup in the arteries? What's the only drug you know that prevents the liver from manufacturing LDL cholesterol and dumping it into the blood? That's not, oh, okay. Well, you're not going to give somebody insulin to lower their LDL cholesterol. Nice, the statins. Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor. Say, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you said it? You know what I'm going to do when I'm, I'm going to just say, oh, I ask a question. Right, huh? So there's some type of anticoagulant, beta blocker, nitroglycerin, not all day, every day, right? That's PRN with chest pain. How many nitro can you give them before you got to call the ambulance? Right, now watch. If you can't reduce that venous return enough to reduce the preload on that heart and reduce the pain, that artery may be completely obstructed. That's why after three nitro, five minutes apart, you're calling an ambulance and getting their fatty acid to the emergency room. Say, yeah. Yeah, I'm Oh, yeah. Or just give them one and then have them ambulate outside. I didn't know what happened. They were feeling good. <laughs> right, now watch. Stable, stable angina means you can predict it. Watch. If I get a bad grade on Blackboard on quiz number three, that gives me chest pain. So how do you not get chest pain? Study. So you get a good grade. So watch, it's predictable. If I walk up the stairs, I can get chest pain. And the same level of exertion will produce that chest pain. Unstable is where walking down the block, you got chest pain. Now, getting out of your chair, you have chest pain. That means the condition is getting worse. That's not stable. An unstable angina is much more critical than stable angina. Say so, yeah. So how do you, real quick, how do you diagnose it? Then we can ambulate home as long as we don't get chest pain. So did you say that stable is predictive? Stable is a predictable. You can predict it, right? 
the same level of activity, you're going to get it. So people know this. You will see maybe grandpa or grandma, right? They're going walking in the park and they start getting a little chest pain. Then they sit down, they pop a nitro, right? They rest a little bit and then they keep, keep on keeping on. Say yeah. The unstable is where it's getting worse, where the, your level of activity is becoming smaller and less demanding and you're now getting chest pain. That needs to be addressed very, very quickly. Or pain that doesn't go away when you rest. If it continues, then you need to get your fatty ass into the emergency room because you may have occluded that artery. Who's with me? You follow? Yeah? Okay. So what are the diagnostic tests to determine if somebody has coronary artery disease? What are, what are the things that you look for? Well, history and physical, yes. Do you smoke, drink, swear, and not read the textbook? So do you have risk factors for heart disease? Smoking, drinking, swearing, elevated cholesterol, family history? Number two, right? Risk factor, high blood pressure. So if you have a bunch of risk factors, then they will begin to do screening tests. And the most common screening test, it's not that invasive, it's not that expensive, and it's pretty accurate, is a stress test. So they get you on a treadmill, hook you up to a 12 lead, and they look at your response to exercise. Say yeah. If that stress test is positive, yep, meaning it shows signs of ischemia, then they move you to a more invasive test. And that is a stress test with imaging. And the stress test with imaging is either, uh, uh, have you ever heard of thallium? Thallium stress test? Valium 201, you've ever heard of it? No? No, that's a pharmacological stress test. They'll do thallium with imaging, or if there's another one, you probably heard of this, uh, cardiolite. Have you ever heard of a cardiolite stress test? Um, basically, all those are, are a regular stress test with imaging. So you get a better look at the heart. You will actually get pictures of the heart. Let me just show you. This is a thallium imaging. Now, watch. What does the sodium potassium pump need in order to work? So if the cells are intact and there you're getting enough oxygen, you're able to make that sodium potassium pump work. Who's following me? If the cells are healthy, the sodium potassium pump will take up the thallium and it will light up the heart. Tell me you got that. Dark areas of the heart didn't take up the thallium, so that could be signs that that part of the heart is ischemic. Then what they do is they say, immediately after you're done with the stress test, like you're coming off the treadmill, they inject the thallium, and then they do the imaging. Then you have to sit around for four hours or so, and they rescan you to see, here, look dark, but four hours later, you got blood flow. That means that part of the heart isn't dead, it just lacked blood flow. So this is ischemic heart disease. If this would have been black forever, then that part of the heart was dead. Cardiolite works similarly. How many people got that? But the gold standard is what? What's the gold standard? Well, that's for kidneys. We're talking. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, I take that back. The, the gold standard for detecting blockages in coronary artery is the angiogram. So what they do is now they're doing it through the brachial artery. Before, they would do it for the femoral artery. 
Arteries are under pressure, aren't they? Right? So people would have to lay there for like eight hours to keep pressure on there with a sandbag. You got me? Because if you get up and you move your fatty ass and you blow that clot, then you're spurtulating down the hallway and they don't like blood on their newly waxed floors. You could die. But now with the, uh, the new uh, brachial artery, a lot of the young uh, interventional cardiologists are using that, so you don't have to lay there. You can get up and move around. You just have to, you know, don't get put people in a headlock or something like that. So basically what they do is they thread the catheter through the artery, through the coronary artery, and then they inject the dye, and then they can actually see the fluoroscope under the fluoroscope, and you can actually see the dye going through the artery. So if you look here, this little arrow is saying that's an arrow. Now, the arteries that are open, you're going to see the dye as dark. And then you can see where you got this nice open artery, and then all of a sudden, the blood flow kind of looks like it goes away right here. There's a blockage in the coronary artery. And then what they'll do, and we'll finish up with this, is depending on the coronary artery, they will then use, slide a catheter over it, and they will do what's called a uh, coronary angioplasty. So they will slide the catheter through that little hole, and there's a balloon on the end, and they'll inflate the balloon and smash the plaque into the wall to open up that artery. And then they will use a coronary artery or PTCA, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, uh -huh, with a stent. So basically it reinforces that opened artery and prevents it from collapsing. When you jack with a coronary artery, it gets irritated. When you irritate a coronary artery, it spasms. And when it spasms, it can completely occlude. That's why um, you always have to have uh, standby bypass surgery for someone who's doing angioplasty because those arteries can spasm. Just let me show you this and then you can ambulate. So, did they show you? So they're th threading it, right? Then they slide the catheter over that has the balloon. Then they inflate the balloon. And they smash that cholesterol plaque into the wall of the artery. And now, within probably the last 25, 30 years, they now routinely use a stent. And basically, like that's reinforced concrete in a tunnel to prevent that artery from re-collapsing. And that stent is coated with an anticoagulant to prevent blood clots from forming that. So this stays in basically forever. It's, as you expand it, it's kind of like a, like a, you know, you, those little like chain link fences. When you expand it, unroll it, it doesn't compress. And because it's round, right, all the forces are kind of working on it the same way and prevent it from collapsing. How do you scrape the plaque out? They do. They do, right? So yeah. why wouldn't they do that versus this? Um, because that's much more invasive, and then you have to actually go in and, some of that plaque can break off and then down the, uh, the road a little bit can uh, block a smaller artery. So uh, a lot of uh, surgeons, when they would do bypass surgery, they would cut open the coronary artery, drill it out, and then reconnect it. It's called a coronary artery endarterectomy. Ar so, but you're on bypass for like eight, 10 hours. I worked with a surgeon, he would take a nap while he was doing surgery. Like you would take like an hour long nap and keep the person on bypass. They they come out of surgery looking like the state puff marshmallow man. And then the people they saw their husband or wife go in, and they were like, and then they come out and they're like all bloated up and then everybody's faint. And so you're getting chairs trying to catch them, right? Because they're not used to it. It looks bad. Okay, um, we'll finish up on Tuesday. We'll have a quiz on Thursday. Can we do that? Will you watch the videos? I'm not going to put them on anymore. You know what I should do? I should give you a, I should have like, we'll go over a section where I don't have any videos on it. I just go over the stuff in class. I wanted to see how you do. Right, F, F, F. Because I know what you're thinking. Oh, I'll watch this video. And then you never watch the video. Ain't that right? <laughs>